God and, and sing your praises God thank you that you're so wonderful and God I pray you just help us to uh, hear the words from your blessed book and God uh, help it to help our lives and Lord uh, make it so we can have something to uh, make us better Christians and walk closer to you Lord uh, help us now in this hour come back and get us or that'd be okay too if we had church up yonder Lord up yonder is a lot better than down here Lord, thank you for your promises. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansion, bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. While we walk the pilgrim pathway, God will overspread the sky. But when traveling days are over, not a shadow, not a sign. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of Him in glory will the cause of life repay. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Onward to the cross before us, soon his beauty will behold. Soon the choir 
Take the streets of Pensacola, but there ain't nothing compared to what we're going to have. And I, you know, I'm thinking there ain't going to be no potholes up there. <laughs> there seems to be a lot of potholes in Pensacola here lately. All right, turn to Proverbs 18. Proverbs 18. Now, this is a verse you've probably heard quoted before, and it's a good verse. Uh, you ought to memorize it if you ain't got it memorized. Um, it's about, it's about our Lord, really. So, well, everything in the Bible is about the Lord. Well, some things are, most things are. Of course, he tells the story, the truth about the devil and his crowd. Uh, he tells the truth about the world and their crowd. He tells the truth about Christians that live for God and some that don't. But most of it's about him and how good he is. So, Proverbs 18, verse 24 is a good verse to get started in. It says, A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. You can take that as a good axiom. You ain't going to have no friends if you're a grumpy grump. And there is a friend that sticketh <coughs> closer than a brother. Heavenly Father, help us now. Help us to uplift the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray you will realize that God, no matter what else he is, he is our friend. And he sticks with us, no matter what. Thank you, Lord, for this promise. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. I titled this sermon, A Friend Is... Dot, dot, dot. Amen? A Friend Is... Dot, dot, dot. Now, uh, some people agonize over what friendship is. There's different levels of friendship, just like there's different levels of love. Um, I love chocolate candy, but I'm not going to marry chocolate candy. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's a two different kinds of love. Um, I love my pets, but, you know, uh, they're still just pets. Amen? Um, they can't talk to me. Sometimes you have to guess what they're trying to tell you. Um Sometimes you get it right, sometimes you don't. Uh, I love my wife. Now, that's a pretty important love, to love your wife. You ought to love your wife. And wives, you ought to love your husband. And we ought to love the Lord. But here, the Bible talks about friendship, and he talks about a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And, you know, he is our Savior. He's our Lord. Um, he's the one who we need to obey. He's the one we're looking for to come back and get us. But one of the greatest things we can say is God is a Christian's friend. You know, sometimes you're not going to have any human friends. Or if you do, they're going to be so far away they don't do you any good. I was on the road for seven and a half years. And a lot of times I was away from the church and away from Brother Bill and my friends here in Pensacola. And I didn't have any friends where I was. He said, what about the church people that you met? Well, some of them were friendly and some of them weren't. And if they, even if they were, they were still strangers to me. I didn't know who they were. I didn't know how they... You know, I just couldn't say anything to them I wanted to say. You ever wonder why God wanted to walk in the garden with Adam and Eve? He wanted to be their friend. He wanted to come at the cool of the day. Now, he could have come at the heat of the day and made him get out in that garden and sweat, but he didn't. He waited till the most pleasant time of the day and came down and walked in the cool of the day with them. Just a, a dead Bible don't say what they talked about, but I imagine it was stuff friends talk about. Maybe Adam and Eve asked questions. Well, God, why'd you make that silly-looking animal over there I called an elephant with that goofy-looking nose of his? It's, it's, you know. And God said, oh, because I wanted to. And God, how about that snail thing over there. I, I called it a snail. It's kind of a, 
gooey and yucky. And he said, well, I, I have a purpose for him. You just leave him alone. Let him do his thing. I don't know what they talked about. But I know God wanted to be their friend. Why did God take Enoch to heaven before he died? Well, he walked with God, and I think he had a friendship with God, a profound friendship. Well, how about that? Well, we think about if you had a good enough friendship with God, he just decided not to let you die. He'd just take you. That would be something. And why did Jesus come to this planet? Well, you may say to redeem men. Well, that's true. That's why he died and suffered on the cross. That's why he rose again the third day. That's why he went to heaven and all power is given to him in heaven and earth. And he told his disciples, go out and preach, preach the gospel. But you know, there's another reason that he came. Not only to redeem men from hell, but to restore the fellowship that God had with men. That's a very important reason why he came. And that's what I'm going to preach on this morning. Is the friendship and fellowship that Jesus Christ our Lord brought with him. Let's look, see what the Bible says about this verse here in Proverbs 18. I want you to notice that there's a, 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 a present tense to this verb, this verse. A present tense. It's not about the past and it's not about the future. It, the best religion is right now. You know, if your religion doesn't work right now, I'd do something about it. Because right now is what you got. You can't change the past. You can't uh, but just influence the future. But it's not here yet. When you need God, you usually need Him right now. I know I have. And you know, the, the book says there is. Look, look at that word is. It's a, it's a present tense word. Uh, if something is, it's always in the present. And God's always in the present. And we don't understand God. I mean, God is in the present back in the Garden of Eden and back in creation. He's in the future and the present. But he's with us because he's an eternal God. And we don't understand how he works. Even with 66 books in the Bible, we only have a little glimmer of God Almighty. But you know, uh, us in the present age, we have a blessing. Uh, in John, the book of John, uh, chapter 14, Jesus said this uh, in verse number 25. Uh, John 14, 25. He said, These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. So notice Jesus is talking about this very same subject I am. Jesus said, Look, I'm here with you now. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have spoken unto you. Uh, he prophesies about the whole coming of the Holy Spirit. Look, Christians have the Holy Spirit living inside of them. You know, I, I, I've, been, uh, I've been looking into... Uh, tonight we're going to uh, get into this better tonight. Uh, but I've been studying about the charismatic movement and the Pentecostal movement in this country. And one of the errors that they teach is that you have to get the Holy Spirit after you're saved. You don't. He comes with it. If you didn't get him uh, the day you got saved, guess what? You didn't get saved. Every saved person has the Holy Spirit living inside of him. Now, he may not be filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, maybe he's quenched him. Maybe he's grieving him. Maybe, like I said, he's got him in the closet somewhere back in his heart. Say, stay there. Don't, don't mess with me. I want to do my thing. But somewhere in him lives the Holy Spirit of God. Whenever I, now, I let me tell you, you know, Brother Bill used to like to tell you Brother Bill secrets. I'm going to tell you Brother Jeff's secret. Whenever I meet somebody, especially someone that says they're a Christian. You know what I immediately pray? I said, well, God, if he's a Christian, the Holy Spirit's down in him somewhere. Now, you may meet someone and say, I'm a Christian, and he's living like the devil. You know, sometimes you meet some guy, and I mean, he looks like he's got the stench of hell all over him, but he said, well, I'm a Christian. 
That's what I pray. I said, well, God, show me the Holy Spirit inside this man. And you know, he always does. He either shows me he ain't there, or he shows me he's there. And if he shows me he's there, and the guy looks like a reprobate, I start dealing with him about getting right with God. I treat him like a brother, but I treat him like a wayward brother. But if God gives me the signal that this guy's lost, I start dealing with him by salvation. Not only do we have the Holy Spirit in us, but you know what? Who else we have with us? We have Jesus Christ. Matthew 1, 23. It's Christmas time, so I'll quote you a Christmassy verse. Matthew 1, 23. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So Jesus was called Emmanuel, the person that means God's with us. Jesus is with us. He's God. And he's with us all the time. He's the Son of God. 1 John 1, 3 says, That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with what? With who? Is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Well, that reminds me, we got the Holy Spirit, we got Jesus with us, and we have the Father with us. Isaiah 8, 10. Take counsel together, and it shall come to naught. Speak the word, and it shall not stand. For God is with us. It's talking about the enemies of God. Go ahead, he says in Isaiah. Go ahead and talk bad about us. Go ahead and do all the meanness you're going to do. It won't stand because God's with us. Ephesians 4, 6. One God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. So we got the Father, we got the Son, and we got the Holy Ghost living inside of us. Of course, it's through the person of the Spirit of God. If you really want to know God as your loving Heavenly Father, you consider companionship with Him your greatest treasure. I heard of a father who had been away from home about seven months. On his return, he took his family to a shopping center, handing some money to his little girl. He said, Lydia, take this money and buy anything you want. Boy, that's a dangerous thing to say nowadays. The child's eyes filled with tears. As she clung more tightly to his hand, she said, what's the matter, honey? He said, I don't want money, Daddy. I want you. He's present with us. Not only that, but he, he, friendship is persistent. It's persistent. Notice the word in that verse, sticketh. <laughs> Now, it's got an old old time uh, uh, ending on it. But the root word of stick is a stick. Now, I'm not talking about a branch off a tree. I'm talking about sticky stuff. I'm talking about something once it gets a hold of you, it's going to stay. He used to have an old preacher I knew, brother, brother Jim McGahey, and he had a sermon on stickability. <coughs> stickability. If you ever can hear that sermon on tape or disc or something, I, I'd listen to that. It's about Christians sticking around for God. You know, the Bible has a definition of what stick means. You say, really? Yeah, really. Job 41, verse 17 says, they are joined one to another. They stick together that they cannot be sundered. Actually, this passage is talking about the great dragon we read about this morning. Ah, God talks about Satan. Because Satan is the one that's got poor old Job all balled up. God allowed Satan to come down and mess with Job. And he talks about the great dragon. And he says, the scales on this dragon are, 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 are so stuck together that, that you couldn't pry them apart with a crowbar or a pulling machine. That's, that's sticking. That means that thing is, that, that is so, so close you can't get it asunder. Um, not only uh, does it mean uh, 
to, to be uh, uh, stuck on someone you can't get it off. But it means to cleave as one. Cleave as one. Now cleave is an old word we don't use, children. Cleave is cleave is mean you get to someone and you get so close that that uh, you almost look like you're one person. Uh, sometimes you see somebody that has been away a long time and they come up to their family and boy they but especially this time of year at Christmas families and they just hug that person and put their arms around them and it's like they're never gonna let them go. That's what it means to cleave as one. Genesis 2, 24, Therefore shall a man cleave, leave his uh, father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. Christ in the church is pictured here. Christ, uh, he's with everybody in the church. If you're saved, you're part of the church. And, and Christ came so he can, he can stick to you. He's persistent. He wants to be stuck to you. Sometimes I wonder why he bothered with me, but he, he loves me. He wants to stick with me. He wants to help me. And the Bible says that cleaving also has to do with grace and purpose. Acts 11. Acts, well, um, let's look at Ephesians 5 first, though. Uh, Ephesians 5, 29. For no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourisheth it and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bone. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Now let's look at Acts 11. Acts eleven twenty three, Who when he came and had seen the grace of God was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people were added unto the Lord. This is talking about a preacher here. Uh, but, but any Christian can have that relationship with the Lord. You know, God has a purpose for our life. And God is persistent in that purpose. He'll tell you what to do every day if you'll get down on your knees or sit by the side of your bed or something. When you get up and say, God, help me today. Show me what to do. Please be with me. I pray by the end of the day you'll be happy with what I've done. I guarantee you you God who's persistent will come and show you what to do that day and he'll help you do it he's that good he's that good men off men often lose much of their worth when they become detached from the world of persons and the things about him or them there are many forms of life that can't survive in isolation. A sponge, for instance, that you get at the bottom of the sea. Um, it's A sponge is meant to live in the bottom of the sea. It's meant to be other sponges. Its whole life cycle is, is at the bottom of the sea. Uh, when you take a sponge from out of the sea, guess what? It dies. Because that's not where it's meant to be. Uh, the lichen that grows on the side of the rock or on the trees. Uh, you know, that lichen will stay on one side of that tree. And whenever you take some of that, and let's say you tried to transport, transplant it on the other side of the tree, it will not grow. It will die. Because it was meant for that location. There's something about that rock that it grows on or that tree that it grows on that has just the right thing that it needs to grow and to live. A man isn't made like that. His power and usefulness come not in isolation but with union and cooperation with others. Life can be truly valuable in God's sight uh, and and uh, if it's only attached to the Lord Jesus Christ. We need him just as every member of our body needs to be attached to your body. Look, you you detach your, your hand from, from your body and it's going to die. It's not going to crawl around like the thing on the Adamus family. It's not going to do that. It's just going to lay there and die. And, and if you don't stop your bleeding, you might die too. It's meant to be attached to you, your arm. Your eyeballs work because they're in your head. 
Your mouth works because it's in your head. Your heart works because it's inside of you. That's the way Jesus Christ is. He's persistent. He sticks to us so we can have a life. So he's present. Says there is a friend that sticketh. But notice he's our partner. He's our partner. You still got that 10 gallon hat? Put it on. You got your hat? Yeah, put it on. Put it on. All right, stand up. See, he's a partner, like a Western partner. That's not what kind of partner I'm talking about. Don't sit down. Well, it sort of is. When you say, hey, partner, it means someone you're traveling with. So it sort of is. Look, sometimes you get friends that are closer than all your relatives. You and your wife should be close together as good friends. You should have a relationship with your wife like that. A partner in life. Notice he's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Closer than a brother. Boy, you know, I had a sister now. I didn't have a brother. But, but to her dying day, I could get together with my sister. And there was a kinship there that was just there because we were related to one another. And you can't explain it to someone that's not part of the family. Especially if they have no siblings. Um, we need we need someone with us in this life. And you know what? I came down here to Pensacola years ago, and I didn't know anybody. I didn't have a job. I didn't have a place to stay. But you know what I found over the years? God gives me friends and sisters in the Lord and brothers in the Lord. And some of those people became closer to me than my brothers and, and, and cousins and what have you in my own family. In fact, my family is still kind of a stranger to me. Ecclesiastes 4 verse 9 says, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one shall lift up his fellow. But woe unto him that is alone when he falleth. Oh, ain't that the truth? Linda, those times you fell, aren't you glad I was around? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Amen. And sometimes we had to call the fire department. We were glad they came. Them sturdy old firemen guys. Them big old burly fellows. Woe be unto him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. Look, I don't care if you're alone in this world. You have a friend inside of you. You have someone you can call upon you that can lift you up. <laughs> Look, I... I, I, I I've gone a lot of places in, in my vehicle all over the country. And I've seen the Lord do marvelous things. I've seen the Lord uh, pick me up when I had fallen down. I've seen the Lord help me with vehicles that didn't want to run right. I, I've had him come to meetings that I didn't think was going to do anything. All because I could call upon my friend. The Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and, and, and there's something else about being a partner with someone. There's a partaking that comes with partnership. One of the greatest things to do with a friend is go, go eat somewhere with them. Either bring them over to your house and feed them, or they bring you over to their house and feed you, or you go out to somewhere. Me and Brother Bill used to go out places all the time. He would find a new place, and he'd come by and pick me up one day and say, I want to take you. He'd take me out somewhere to eat. Sometimes it was okay, and sometimes it wasn't. Uh, but, uh, you know, we did that, and we enjoyed uh, each other's company. Um, but there's a glorious partnership that you miss out when you're not a partner with the Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 3 says that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Whereof I am made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effectual working of his power unto me who am less than the least of all the saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Look, Paul says, look, I'm nothing. But I got a friend who's really powerful. And I got a friend who can really do stuff that I can't do. And look, children, if you make a friend of the Lord Jesus Christ, you got a powerful friend. You got a friend who can move the universe.
a happy Christian met an Irish peddler one day, and he said, "'Tis a grand thing to be saved." Aye, said the peddler, it is. But I think something is equally as good as that. What could possibly equal salvation? The man, the no, the companionship of a man who has saved me was the reply. When we know that, we can rejoice with John and say truly our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. This old Irish guy, he knew Jesus Christ as his Savior. And he said, oh, it's a good thing to be saved. But the fellowship and partnership you have with God sometimes is greater than that. That's good to remember the day you got saved. But you know, if you walk with the Lord very long or very far, you're going to have times that's going to equal and sometimes surpass the day of your salvation. In conclusion, there's an old song that we sing. Matter of fact, it's one of the most famous songs of all in the hymn book. It was written by Charles Wesley. There's 6,500 hymns that Charles Wesley wrote. Did you know that? 6,000 hymns. This is generally considered his finest work. It is still found in nearly every published hymn book and has been translated into almost every known language. It is interesting to note that when Charles first showed this text to his brother for approval, it was rejected for being too sentimental. It was not until after his death, Charles's death, that the song came into general use. It was first published in 1740 in a collection of 130 hymns known as Hymns and Sacred Poems. Many authorities claim this is his greatest hymn. The late Dr. Bodine said it's the finest heart hymn in the English language. A hymn of this quality, however, really doesn't need any popular account of its origin to give it added greatness. The meaningful simplicity of his text is sufficient. It should be noted that 156 simple one-syllable words appear among the 188 words of the text. That's over two-thirds. Christ is presented as lover, healer, refuge, fountain, wing, pilot, the all-sufficient one. Truly, each believer can say with Wesley, O Christ, art all I want, more than all in thee I find. Many different tunes have been used with this text, uh, including several fine anthems and classical settings. The best known of these tunes is the American Martin, composed by Simon B. Marsh, who was born in uh, New York in 1798. He was an organist and choir director and an itinerant Sunday school singing teacher. He was also a very devout Presbyterian Christian layman. On one day on the fall of 1834, he wrote out this tune and called it Martin. And the song we're talking about is Jesus, lover of my soul. Let me to thy bosom fly. While the nearer waters roll, while the tempest still is nigh. Hide me, O oh, thou Savior, hide. Till the storms of life are past. Safe unto the haven guide. O oh, receive soul at last. Well, I tell you what, we love singing that hymn around here. Every time it gets quiet and the singing gets sweet and the Holy Spirit comes down and deals with our hearts because we know that Jesus is our friend. He's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. You say, well, what am I supposed to do? Well, you know, We've passed Thanksgiving, but it wouldn't hurt you to say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for answering my prayer. Thank you for being my friend. Thank you for sticking with me, even though uh, sometimes I did something evil or wicked or sinful, and, and you should have just dropped me like a hot rock, and you didn't. You know why he didn't? Because he loves us. He loves his children. So, go home and thank him. 
Go home, and next time you have a problem, go to your friend. You say, that's an invitation? Yeah, it is an invitation. Maybe it's been a long time since you prayed to the Lord and had some quiet time with Him. Go spend some time with Him. Get in the Word and, and eat, eat, eat the feast from the Word with your friend. Laugh and joke with Him. You know, God does have a sense of humor. Be His friend back. Thank you, Lord, for our friend, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, he's the best friend I ever had. And I've had some pretty good friends. Lord, thank you for what you do. Thank you for hearing us when we call upon you. Thank you for letting your presence be known in, in our heart and souls. And God, thank you when we're down, you lift us up. And thank you when we're too pride to put us down. Thank you when we're, uh, God, we get confused and don't know where we're going. You show us the way. And God, thank you when we're poor, you give us riches. And thank you when we get too rich, you take some things away that we need taken away. Lord, thank you for what you do for us, Lord. You're truly a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Thank you for being our friend and our Savior. And thank you for walking with us all these years, God. And I pray you come back and get us, Lord. God, we want we God, you're our friend, but we've never seen you. We've never laid eyes on you. We've never been face to face with you. So I pray you come back, and God blessed be that day. Help us now as we leave this place. Help us to shine the light in this community, and God show folks that Jesus is our friend, and make them want to have. A friend like Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.